Oh, it's all it's so cold. I hate it. I've been reading rhyme properly because now that we're starting to work with the with the other creatives for tier two stuff. Um, man, am I really impressed with the design of that book? Holy shit, dude! That's pretty good. I'm uh, with Vasco. I'm taking um rhyme and I'm mixing it with uh, I Spire. So hey, I was. We were. I was talking with Ducky. I was commenting about how uh, Watsi does such a good job laying out the three potential paths to getting someplace. Like the the gap between how do you leave Icewind Dale to get to Oral's Island? I'm gonna try not to spoil it because we have people joining chat. Yeah. They give you. <laughs> they give you three options that the party could pursue to cross over from chapter four to five. And I like how two of them kind of intersect with things the party may have done when they were getting to know Icewind Dale. So they're yeah. amazed to build off of that. I don't yeah, know it, how they go about architecting the cross-linking for that right away, but I think, but I'm consistently impressed about how much storytelling potential they get out of like a single sentence. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think they do. <laughs> I think they do a pretty good job of like, um, or the story. The only thing I wish is there was a little bit more, um, foreshadowing for what the later chapters are like. Um, I agree. Way. I think I, I knew because like the whole the whole complaint. like arcane brotherhood seems kind of like left out of out of left field. Like what? Who are these people? <laughs> what, like the earliest the earliest sign of it, I think, is probably hey, when you get to East Haven. But yeah, I don't think you get a lot before that. Yeah. Hey everybody. Um, we're just um letting folks roll in. We'll probably get started at about uh, I don't know ten after. So, um, uh, yeah, you should definitely pick up Icewind Dale. It's Wizards of the Coast's best book by far so far. Um, they did a really good job with it. I wasn't crazy about Avernus, uh, even though, like, I think it had some really good ideas. It just didn't gel. But yeah, Rhyme of the Frost you can tell, like, like, with the same sort of design struggles we go through trying to work with other folks, like, we can see them in Watsi books every now and then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know. It's, it's a process, man. It's a process. <laughs> you just keep on trying to figure it out. Yeah, thanks for coming in, everybody. We're excited. Um, we're going to wait until 10 after. Um, but we'll, this will be hopefully a lot of fun for everybody. We're going to be writing some adventures. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I, I finished. I got through Vasco Vale. I got through most of the preamble today and then I'm right at at the where the quest to begin. So Cattle Wrestling Country will come up first. Um, I'm excited for folks to get it because uh if for the for the people who are joining so you know, context we're finishing up the um the final version of the Vasco Valley content. You all got a lot of teasers for that over yeah. the last months. If you're a patron uh, some of the, is, yeah. if you're a patron you uh, would have gotten some of them about like Stonehill Blues, yeah. <laughs> uh Attack the Warehouse yeah, we, should, we probably should have set people up a little bit better with it because we just were they were like, why are they posting all these third level adventures? And uh <laughs> <laughs> the, the the goal is they all equal one giant module, which we've been working yeah. on since I think we started in November um cooking this one up and it should be out. Uh well I'm I mean I'm in the final stages now. Uh yeah, it's um, yeah, it's pretty cool. It takes place in Omeria. So if you're my patron, you're familiar. That's my campaign world. And it's in Vascal Valley, which is a, um, like, a, what's the best way to describe Vascal? Um, without, be, without being, like, not PC about it, Sarge. Because <laughs> I, know, I, know, I know how you and I would just, I know how you and I would just describe it, like, in chat. But that may not be a... <laughs> <laughs> if you want if you've been wanting to run a D D setting set in like a grassland setting that features kind of a, a spaghetti western feel that yeah. transitions surprisingly into another genre um i think yeah you that's i was in a weird mood uh, <laughs> uh yeah richard for sure once you get the the basics of um so richard asks if we can if you can take the uh the stuff and put it into call of cthulhu yeah definitely um call of cthulhu i would say is more event and mystery driven than this and this is going to definitely be more location driven but there are some uh call of cthulhu campaigns which um do have some location type stuff like uh i would say uh i'm trying to think of some ones that i read recently 
Uh, the other thing with Call of Cthulhu is it has tons and tons of backstory, which I don't think 5e has as much and we kind of push against, but you kind of need it for Call of Cthulhu. Um, but yeah, this is some, like we've got a um, after we do this tonight, we'll be talk. We'll have a um, Q&A session on our discord and we'll be answering a bunch of questions like that. But yeah, for sure. Like, I think once you get the basics of how to design an adventure and in the words of Call of Cthulhu, a scenario, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's it's all the same. Um, I don't I wouldn't say that Call of Cthulhu's material, at least what's been written by like Peterson and the gang for like the last whatever 35 years or so conforms to a specific style like fifth edition content does but still i mean yeah know. what you're going to get from us is sort of the understanding of what are the major what are the major building blocks you need to put together if you're trying to assemble some content for your players or for in your case our patrons and yeah. folks who enjoy our content yeah, uh, and we're going to focus on making sure you understand how to use the tools that you already have, and trying to avoid reinventing the game every yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've um, you know, I've been doing this for, and we'll go into this more, but um, and everybody who's just coming in, uh, we're going to get started here at like about eight ten. If you don't already, if you've got a copy of the Dungeon Master's Guide, I would say have that handy. I mean, you don't have to. Um, you know, I've got my physical copy, but you can also get it on D and D Beyond, or you know. They've got to show you the pictures of his worn out monster CR tables. This, thing is bust. <laughs> Boy, this, this book has been through the ringer. Like, I bought this brand. I bought this brand new MSRP uh, three years ago, and it. We offered like, to get him a new one, and he will not. <laughs> I've got I've got two ebooks there. Better this thing. Yeah. I got one, I got first edition modules. That are. <laughs> oh, we would recommend his book, Zach. Uh, Zach asked us what do we uh, yeah, think yeah. of the monsters. Well, know first what of all, doing. Keith Keith is amazing. Uh, he's a really nice guy, and he sent me a signed copy. Ooh, <laughs> but yeah, a hundred percent. Um, like, uh, Eric, it's be about an hour or two. Hour, well, I'd say two hours is about how far we went. Um, just that's just we ended up with like a half hour of extra time the other day, so we answer a lot of questions, but. Uh, yeah, the monsters know what they're doing. It's amazing. Um, I, I love Keith Amon's work, and it's one of the things that inspired me to actually start my own brand. Uh, Hunter asked so us about duration. We're going to be a, probably about 90 minutes, including maybe a two, five to 10 minute breaks. Yeah, and we'll we'll do a Q&A after when we've got whatever, how much time we've got left. And then we do a second Q&A on our Discord channel where um so we continue this room expires after about two hours um yeah we get booted out <laughs> uh <laughs> unless we pay webinar jam more money <laughs> and so um um yeah it'll be about two hours and if you want to do q a stuff we'll be um in discord chat to be able to do that for you as well uh, uh yeah we'll, we'll go over all this all these questions you guys have so far so it should be pretty good um yeah, camel, camel, camel is is pretty useful. It sounds Eric sounds like a he might have been in Amazon sales before. <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll we'll go over all these details and answer questions. But it's it's um yeah in terms of level, the length of the adventure, uh, what kind of adventure we're going to be writing, stuff like that. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Uh, yeah, Richard, we'll go into that in a bit. Uh, and th there's no price to this class. Let me um turn that off so there's no confusion. Um, but this class is free. Um, all five weeks of it is free starting today. We have another offer that'll be presented at the end of this and I'll go over the details of that. But as far as like today and, um, like next week and the week, uh, week after that for like five weeks, it'll be hundred percent free. So you'll learn everything you need to know in this class on how to create, um, a 5e adventure like pretty much exactly like i do like in fact there's nothing that i'm teaching in this class that isn't exactly what i do um when i go to start with an adventure like from square true. from zero yeah i mean i'll follow the rules man watsy says do it like this i say okay <laughs> uh um, you'd be surprised some of the really weird stuff we've gotten out of these yeah, there'll be and there's going to be replays directly on this. I think if you go back to the original links, it sends you to a replay of the um of this. So, uh, I was checking the statistics today. It, like, automatically records for you. So once you go back to the same link, it'll have a replay of it. And then likely, I'm probably going to install a YouTube 
app, which will let us record it and send it to YouTube after we do the um, Saturday class. So we'll have some replays for it on the Saturday class as well. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Someone asked if you if we are if you're automatically signed up for the next one. Uh, no, but we'll give you a link at the end of it where you just go in and you pick your next day. Um, if we did it like just off the original link, you'd have to do the same day every week. So webinar gym didn't have an option to like change it from week to week. But we thought, you know, with people's schedules and all the craziness happening in the world right now that uh, we wanted to do it like week to week. So you could, um, you know, like uh, uh, like if you wanted to do Monday this week, but you couldn't do it Monday next week, then you can switch to Wednesday. So we'll give a link at we the end for that. We received a lot of feedback from you all yeah. that variability was a request in people's yeah. attendance. Yeah, 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 yeah. That way you can do it whenever. And then there's also the replays, which will, um, which I think automatically look. I looked at these statistics today, and it looks like a bunch of people used the replay from the other day. So I'm pretty sure they're working. Yeah, yeah, pretty sure they're working. So we'll have. And then after doing this three times, we'll have plenty of uh, videos. <laughs> uh, yeah, Josh asks if we're going to be creating our own adventure that we'll upload. Um, well, we've got a, we've got 1,200 people in this class, so I don't know that we'll be going through. <laughs> Every single one of them. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, 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 I may have the beard of a college professor, but I, I do not believe that I am. I have to barely read my own material. But uh, we'll have class. We'll have groups and discussions. And I think as we get closer to the end, you know, the, the nature of things, like some people will drop off. So it'll be probably easier for us to interact more. But for now, you know, what we're going to do is like, you, you'll see this class will set. Uh, I'll kind of present all the information to you and then we're going to set some like homework and stuff. And then we've got a, a, a discord channel where you can go in. If you're not already in there, there's a free version of the discord channel. If you go to my discord and we'll also have a workshop channel where um, you can do Q and a with us afterwards. Um, but yeah, like, uh, yeah, James for now, it should be every Monday, Wednesday, Saturday. I think that works pretty well with our schedules. So um, I, I usually do family time on all the other days of the week. So <laughs> believe it or not, I take a day off every now and then. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't, I don't stop writing. That's you know, true. He does day. it. Cause he'll send me, he'll send me a link at ridiculous o'clock. Sorry, you wrote something. <laughs> yeah. I, wrote, I, wrote this. I, need, I need this proof <laughs> now. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, we're going to wait three more minutes, guys. Any other real quick questions I can go over? Um, uh, Megan asked us if these are sequential, the same class. They are sequenced. So this week is uh, the basics on how to write an adventure. Next mm -hmm. week, we'll be getting a little more into the nitty gritty. And then yeah. we'll have some more follow up the, in the, the following weeks. Yeah, yeah. The way you wrote material, I find days off to be. <laughs> yeah, some people don't believe I, uh, I, I write the rate that I do. I put in, I think I did 7,000 words today. That's a light day. Um, the That's last true. one like I wrote, you, I wrote you got through two big sections through, for the Vasco Valley content today. Yeah, well, I did the big Griff section, and then I did I did a big thing for Griffin Saddlebag. Um, oh, I'll, I'll, good. Oh, question. we're actually going to start with that, next. Richard. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, you'll 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 get the whole history of me. Um, <laughs> um what was I going to say? I don't remember. I'll answer uh, Jake's question about re-registering. Uh, yes, there will be a new link for each week that gives yeah. you all a little bit of flexibility. Yeah, it'll be at the top, and we'll make sure. It's part of your homework assignment, too. So, <laughs> yeah, you'll have to, to sign up for it. Um, if you like us and you think we're charming lads, um, that is, and you, you feel like you've learned enough. Uh, thoughts on converting a video game to D&D? &D? Uh, yeah, go for it. Um, you know, obviously, there's IP involved um we can do DD &D in fifth edition because it runs on what's called a ogl or an srd um, which means their their rules are open and all their monster most of their monsters are, are free for us to use in our content video games of course are going to have their own related ip so if you want to go make the last of us into a video game and you're using like actually the names of the characters and stuff like that well you know you wouldn't be able to publish it professionally now having said that there are some people out there who don't seem to mind and there's an entire like star wars fifth edition srd or <laughs> rpg that just is like whatever disney i don't care <laughs> but uh yeah for the most part yeah you can do whatever you like especially if you're doing it for yourself uh yeah dylan i'll go over that oh well it's private to me <laughs> um for <laughs> yeah i know Woo. for uh um... advice, for 
for advice on professional writers, somebody asked. Um, I, I will have some details on that at the close of this as well, because um, I, I have been a professional writer for, God, five or six years now. Um, so, yeah, if you are interested in that, we'll have some of this. We'll be talking to some of this. Um, yeah, Zach, you, sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, that would be amazing. Honestly, Zach, if, if they accept it, I really want to hear about it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I did. I did have somebody once um, like they had to do like as a, an assignment, they had to interview me for their course, which I thought was pretty weird. I'm like, okay. All right, guys. Well, it is 10 after I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, like I said, if you've got a copy of the Dungeon Master's Guide, you might want to grab that. We will be mostly reviewing Chapter 3. This is pretty much the only week you're really going to need it. Um, always should have a copy on hand. If you don't have a physical copy, you know, or if you don't want to buy one, there's, you know, you can go to D&D Beyond and get a digital copy, uh, copy, copy, or you can find it in various places on the internet. I don't think I named to, need to name any of those. I won't tell you either because <laughs> I might get in trouble. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, there's there's uh, plenty of places for that. I'm going to turn my eyes away from the chat just so I'm not distracted by it so I could go through this material here. But we, if you do have questions, hold those uh, for now. We will try to answer them at the end of each part. Okay, let's see. All righty, folks. Welcome to our How to Write Adventures for Tabletop RPGs class. Now, we will be mostly doing 5th uh, edition, but um, as some of you have asked, you know, this is material that you can use whether you're doing Pathfinder RPG, uh, I'd say Call of Cthulhu, pretty much anything. Um, granted, some of the nitty-gritty math stuff will be more driven towards 5th um, edition and, and keeping the game balanced on that. Um, you would have to use whatever rule set that those other whatever like rules they have that those other rule sets um have to balance their own games but for the most part a lot of these like little details you'll find to be somewhat similar uh all right so an introduction who is dm dave well that's me Ooh, i just hit my lamp <laughs> i'm dm dave i run uh dmdave.com and dm dave's patreon if you're not a patron it's a uh, patreon.com forward slash dm dave uh, i am a professional fifth edition content writer uh i own own a company, uh, Hammerick Brands LLC, which uh, consists of myself as the head writer. Sarge here is the director of content or whatever title we're giving him this week. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have uh, three more full-time employees and a number of like uh, contract workers that also work for us. But um, this is what we do. We, we make professional fifth edition content. Uh, some of it's some of it's great. Some of it's okay. But you know what? <laughs> we do our best. That's all we can do. <laughs> uh, I've been playing. Uh, I've been in a role-playing games in D and D specifically since 1991. I started with the uh, second edition Black Box. Um, I played a l a little bit of second edition, mostly just with my my younger brother. Uh, but then I played a lot of third edition. I skipped fourth somehow. And then uh, I've been, you know, in the middle of fifth edition for the last, uh, I'd say about three years. And uh, I have a lot of fun with it. I started um, dmdave.com just as a place to hold my notes. And then I started sharing it on Instagram. Started getting people interested in what I was doing. Within three months, I started a Patreon. Um, within a year, I was making enough on that Patreon to to really start growing my business quickly. And then in April of last year during a pandemic no less i quit my full-time job to do this full-time and i uh, haven't looked back since it's been a lot of fun uh sarge take it away uh hi um i go by sarge online i am a former teacher and still a public servant in uh the city of new orleans I have been in 5th edition in a couple of stops and starts since probably 2015, I think. But I got back into the game properly in early 2019. I met Dave in the Griffin Saddlebag server asking questions about errors in Hearth. And then he brought me over There's to... so many. <laughs> he brought me over to his Patreon, and I started helping Dave out. Uh, with some simple stuff. And then when he decided he wanted to see how much we could do with DM Dave and support you all in the content, he asked me to come on. I actually said no at first. 
but, I was down on one knee and everything, you guys. <laughs> but I decided to stick with it. And it's been a really, it's been almost a year, I think, in two weeks. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think so. It's been a really cool year. I got to meet a lot of cool people and we gotten to make a lot of stuff. And it's really exciting seeing people, hearing people's stories about what they're doing with the game. Uh, so that's me. I'm just yeah. a nerd in New Orleans who awesome. helps people play D&D. Sarge is the glue that holds this whole thing together. I'm a mess, y'all. Like, thank <laughs> God. Thank God for Sarge and the Craigs and everybody else we got working here. Because <laughs> uh, Let's talk a little bit better about what you will be learning in this class. Um, this this particular, like, there's going to be a five-week course. We're going to divide it into... Um, uh, different elements of building an adventure and essentially we're going to all as a team we're going to create an adventure together um from conception all the way to or inception conception inception conception Ooh. all the way <laughs> unto having it in a published uh format using something like a tool like gm binder or indesign so you'll get to know everything that it takes to go from like the idea that you have until something that you could actually like sell uh whether it's on drive through rpg or amazon or on your own patreon site or something like that um today specifically we'll just be starting with the basics so we're going to cover a lot of the material that is in the third chapter of the dungeon master's guide i believe that starts on page 71. uh this is pretty much the only day we really just kind of like pour over the dungeon master's guide but i kind of want to reinforce um a, an opinion that I have as well as Sarge here is that, you know, the DMG is one of your, the best tools you can possibly have to understand kind of how Watsi thinks. Arguably, it's not very well organized, but it does have some really good content in it that I, I think is um, super valuable to it, to you if you want to be a uh, adventure writer. Um, there's nothing that I do that, I mean, yeah, we, we have a bunch of insights after, you know, doing this for a few years and I've read hundreds of uh, adventures published by Watsi, but um, there's not much that I do in my own writing that is really that different than what they tell you in that book. Um, finally, <clears throat> if you've got questions, we're going to have Q&A. Um, I'd say uh, ah, we'll, pr we'll probably do them during breaks and stuff. Uh, so a couple times throughout the session. We'll also, if we've got time left, uh, Monday we had like 30 minutes left, so we got time to, uh, to take questions from all of you. Um, and then we're going to do like about an hour long deal in our discord channel, um, after that. So if you've got later time and you are one of our patrons, then you can come into the discord channel and I'll continue to flap my gums. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So if everybody's ready, we're going to go ahead and kind of get started with this stuff. Sarge, I got any missing anything? Nope. No, nope, we're so, good to keep going this, for this now. search. <laughs> no, no, I, I've turned it on. Don't worry, I got you. <laughs> Where is that coming from? <laughs> All right, so um, starting off, we're going to cover the elements of adventure. Um, and, oh, and by the way, like, my headset loves cutting off in the middle of this. So uh, <laughs> if, if, I, if I go out, it, it'll only be temporarily. We're going to cover the elements of adventure. If you open up on page 71 of the DMG, it's going to teach gives you a list of some of the um, the basic stuff that you are going to want to think about while you go to write an adventure. Now, of course, there's, uh, you know, it's it's hard to just condense an entire story into just these things. But I think this kind of gives you a nice little blueprint for what to expect with writing an adventure. Uh, let's see. All right. So first of all, you got a credible threat. And a threat is generally going to be the force, whether it's um, implicit or explicit, that's going to motivate the heroes, i.e. the player characters, into action. Now, this could be anything from like, you know, a single monster or a villain, like a bullet is like uh, attacking somebody's farm. Or, you know, there's a wizard who's causing trouble. Uh, it could be a group of monsters or villains like uh, orcs raiding the place or like an onkeg nest that's uh, eating the inside out or eating the uh, the ground underneath the town causing it to collapse could be a dungeon filled with traps like the classic adventure tomb of horrors or could even be a natural disaster i mean there could be like a, a you know a big tidal wave or something that just blasted a town there's no real enemy you know there's nothing to punch the characters just have to go around and save uh, heroes and it could be really be anything that you can come up with that provides a suitable challenge for um, characters and keeps the players involved. 
Um, next up, uh, familiar tropes with clever twists. So if, if you're not familiar with what a trope is, a trope is a familiar story element, such as a dragon protecting its treasure, uh, orcs raiding a village and saying wizards and towers, you know, the kind of stuff you've seen a million times. Um, it, you know, uh, uh, there's that biblical saying, Ecclesiastes 1.9, uh, there's nothing new under the sun, right? So I, one thing I like to really tell people is that it's it's perfectly fine to use familiar tropes because it quickly kind of sets the tone, establishes the world using story elements that your players and you will already be familiar with. Um, it's just the one thing you want to make sure you do is that you want to put a spin on them. You know, um, we, we've all seen the dragon protecting his treasure, but what if the dragon actually stole it from another monster that's even worse than it and it's scared for its life? Or maybe those orcs raiding the village are actually doppelgangers who are trying to like frame the actual orcs. Um, you know, the crazy wizard could actually not be a wizard at all. He could just be a total fake or he could be like an illusion or something like these are a lot of things that you should think of. And if you really want to get into commercial writing for adventures, um, I find that often going with familiar tropes will become some of your most successful, least commercially successful stuff. Because when people are out there searching on the internet for adventures, they want to find stuff that's familiar to them. And I think that's why, like, if you look at the books that Watsi's produced, like, you know, like to Curse of Strahd, I mean, Vampire in a Castle, right? We've been doing that since 1800s <laughs> with Bram Stoker. But, you know, there's a lot of, like, twists on it, right? Um, the first ever adventure published in Dungeon Magazine, number one, was a Red Dragon Lair. Um, you go to Red Dragon's Lair and you find them and you get a bunch of treasure. You know, it's like, it's it's okay to use those things. And a lot of people always ask me, like, you know, should I should I try to invent something new? I'm like, well, yes and no. Um, you shouldn't stress yourself about making something new because it's it's perfectly fine to do something that, that people are going to be familiar with from square one. Okay. Um, next on, you need a clear focus on the present. And that means that um, this is a really important one and one that I feel um, a lot of new writers sometimes struggle with. Um, a clear focus on the present means the adventures are about here and now. <clears throat> and some history might help, but you really need to focus more on the events that are unraveling in the present and the ones that the adventurers actually have control over. Um, and not even Watsi can be good about this. I'd say like um, uh, after reviewing like hundreds of their adventures through Dungeon Magazine, which if you're not familiar with Dungeon was a <clears throat> series of magazines from the late 80s to right before fourth edition that put out like five to six adventures a month for play with uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Um, they would have like all this backstory and like details and all this stuff. And you'd have like three pages of it. And it was like waiting to like, oh my gosh, what is, what is all this matter? Uh, and ultimately, I think once you realize, well, this stuff doesn't really matter. <laughs> I mean, a little background is okay, but you really want to make sure that when you're writing and you've, you're creating an adventure, the only things that really matter are what the characters have to deal with. Now, you can have that backstory for your head or wherever you need. But when you're writing an adventure, just make sure that it's it's about the here and the now. Uh, you know, don't go writing the Cimmerillion just to have a 3,000 word adventure. <laughs> uh, you want to describe the present situation. You want to describe uh, what the bad guys are up to, and maybe you know maybe their motivations for doing it. Um, and then you want to know how the adventurers become involved in the story. Um, and that's that's really it. You don't even know the history of every tree. Uh, honest, like I had some people ask me about world building. My I will always advocate for start start small and grow big versus big then small. Um, my own campaign world's designed that way, and I'm same way with adventures. Like I think about what I want the the core elements of the adventure look like. And I only create the details as it's necessary for the adventure, because the focus is always going to be on like what's happening during this adventure. Anyways, we can talk about that more later, but I think this is a, like a really, really important um, piece and uh, elements of adventure. Uh, all right, here's a matter. Um, I think this is another big one too, because the we all know what a railroad adventure is, right? You know, we've all either ran one by accident or played one where it felt like there were no meaningful choices. And it's really important that and in your adventures that the adventurer's actions, the player's actions and decisions matter. Um, it could be as simple as having just two outcomes, like what happens if they succeed? What happens if they fail? You know, failure 
is always an option if the characters don't defeat the dragon uh what happens is it burn up the countryside does it eat another town um if you don't stop the mad wizard does he open up a portal to the astral plane and you know get the Yankee warships come flying out like there there needs to be real consequences and the players need to be really like the only ones you know more or less that can stop it because um I, I think about kind of like the joke about indiana jones and raiders of the lost ark um the joke is that if Indiana Jones never got involved in the events that happened during Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, it probably would have played out the same way, right? Like the, the Ark would have fallen into the Nazis hands. The Nazis would have opened it. They all would have destroyed stuff and they would have, they would have, uh, it would have been seized by the government, right? Like nothing he did really <laughs> changed anything throughout the court. If anything, it got more people killed along the way. So you don't want your 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 characters, and ultimately, if you're if you're looking to publish the people who run these adventures, make it seem like it's just like a you know a side quest of the world. It has to be. You want to make it seem like the characters are the most important part of that story. Okay, let's see. Um, how to make something for all player types? This so. There's two parts of this, really. And some of you are going to be interested in, in writing adventures just kind of for your um, your uh, uh, own use and with your own tables. Others of you might be interested in taking a path like myself and Sarge and, you know, like the, the six or seven writers that I got working for me where you want to publish this. But the, 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 thing, the big thing is you have to understand is that um, no two D&D or tabletop RPG players are ever going to be sent. Um, there are ultimately three pillars to every role playing game too. And those three pillars are exploration. And that means exploration isn't just like wandering around in the woods or, you know, going hex crawling or anything like that. It also means like going into a dungeon and seeing what's behind doors, uh, being in a haunted house and wondering what's in the basement. You know, that's all exploration. And that's, that's a series of choices that they get to make. Um, social interaction. Uh, that's, of course, role playing, whether you're role playing directly with the other players, all playing your parts or the uh, um, you are are role playing with the GM who's doing the NPC roles. And then, of course, combat. <laughs> we all know combat is is probably the biggest pillar of all in D&D, whether we like it or not. <laughs> but it's a game that was started as a miniatures war game back in the early 70s. You know, we, we kind of just go with it. <laughs> but yeah, combat's also another big pillar. And recently, I'd say there's almost a fourth pillar too, uh, downtime, which I think um, is slowly becoming more popular because it's a way to continue to play the game, even when you're not, you know, at a table, virtual or otherwise. Um, but different players like different pillars. Uh, we did a survey back in last summer to see. Don't worry, guys. He heard it turn off. No, you're still off right now, Dave. Thanks. It's, it's, it thinks I'm gone. Sorry is. about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's so annoying. I, I, I need to get the rule book out and see why it keeps doing that. It's so obnoxious. Maybe I need to play <laughs> music. Um, I need to be like rocking out while I'm like, yeah, guys, D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, um, where was I? I was talking about the three pillars, possible fourth. Yeah, you were talking about, you were talking about the, <clears throat> the survey we did about. Yeah, the survey we did about, we did a survey on which of the three pillars are most popular or most liked by people who play fifth edition. And interestingly, combat came in third. <clears throat> RPG came in second, and number one was exploration. People said that they wish they had more exploration in their games. And I think, you know, some of that's been left out of uh, fifth edition because it is a very combat heavy game. But um, that was really interesting insights because we could see that it's more than just about, you know, Bop the Dragon. <clears throat> so when you're, cre if you're creating adventures for your own table, and you don't really hope to publish, um, you want to tailor your adventures to fit the players that you have and not those that you want to have. I want to I want to say that as a caveat. Now, um, obviously, you are involved in the storytelling process, too. So do things that are fun for you. But you need to consider that if you have a whole table full of people who just want to do art, 
role playing and all you throw at them is like combat after combat, you know, they're not gonna have a great time. Now, if you are going to be a publisher, you're obviously not going to know what kind of um, table you're going to run into. So you have to kind of think about all the different things and injecting here and there. Now, obviously, you can write for a certain niche. Like you can do like, oh, I'm just I'm just the guy who writes combats. I mean, I've written things that are just pure combat and I've written things that are just pure social interaction, you know, but it's it's good to remember that all of these pillars, especially those first three and maybe even a little bit of the fourth one should all have. <clears throat> presence in your material all right um surprises so surprises um could be anything from like a ruined castle might lead to discovery of a dragon's tomb hidden underneath track through the wilderness might lead to the discovery of a tower that appears only on nights of a full moon um there should be constant um opportunities in the adventure to surprise and delight players but remember it's it's you got to go light on it. Like, you know, um, those of us who are probably old enough to remember, remember like M. Night Shyamalan was a big deal in 1999 when he came out with Sixth Sense, but then he became kind of a joke because every single one of his movies ended with a twist ending. So you have to be careful with like how much you do surprises and how much they can affect the course of the game. But um, yeah, you do too many, it could be off-putting, but still like putting them in there and you it doesn't even have to be like big things. It doesn't have to be like the big twist that the the dragon is actually an illusion or something like that. It could be something as simple as like the one goblin wandering around in the underdark is, you know, speaks with a Cockney British accent. Uh, I guess that's more something you do at your table, but like, or that goblin uh, is actually like a good guy spy or something like that. You know, you can have big surprises, little surprises, but you should always try to include at least a couple in your material. And finally, uh, useful maps. A good adventure needs a thoughtfully constructed map. So like wilderness sprinkled with interesting landmarks are better than just sprawling forest. <coughs> Tomb of Annihilation. <laughs> um, dungeons with branching corridors, traps, and puzzles are better than simple set pieces. Um, you you want to make sure that your maps give good choices. Um, and I'll give, I'm going to give you guys some map resources in a bit once you get your homework assignment. But they want to have every turn on a map is going to be a choice that the characters can take from, you know, basically like what's behind door number one and door number two. Um, should I go through that door over there? Even if there's like a moat filled with sharks in front of it, like all this stuff equates to a useful map. All right. Uh, did I miss anything there, Sarge? No, that was a, uh, that was pretty good. That's, we're getting better at it. Uh, we're going to yeah. go ahead and take some questions at this point. I know we just went over a lot there. Uh, we'll start with uh, Bill's question. Bill asks us if these precepts we're talking about apply to a campaign as well as individual adventures. Um, Like these elements? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, a campaign is more or less going to be a series of interconnected adventures. I mean, side quests might take away from it, but... I, Think of it as a TV show. Like, um, I think there's a couple TV shows within recent history that are like perfect examples of what a D&D campaign looks like. Uh, Supernatural, for one, definitely, especially seasons one through five. And uh, The Mandalorian, um, really, I mean, Jesus Christ, I was watching The Mandalorian and no, no spoilers or anything, but I was like, I was like, every episode is like a side quest to the main quest in this <laughs> adventure. You know, every session you treat like a single episode of a show um and then there's always going to be like an underlying quest underneath now you can do nothing but bottle episodes where it's all just monster of the week stuff but i think the best format is is a blend of the two and you just apply the same elements of adventure uh, there's credible threats per session as well as a you know larger scale threat that looms in the background you know you have familiar tropes per session as well as in the larger campaign uh focus on the present right on what's going on and then the best part about campaigns, too, is that the heroes matter more, right? Because if you are tailoring each episode of the campaign to kind of go with what they're doing, you know, it's going to follow, um, it, it's going to, you, they're going to change things, right? Like if they didn't stop the bad guy in the last episode, that could affect what things are going to be in the next episode. <clears throat> all, and then, too, uh, something for all player types, like having different episodes focus on different things will uh change it up right i mean you could have one episode that's more combat 
one episode that's more exploration, one that's more social interaction, you know? And then, yes, yeah, surprises as well. Uh, you know, what good, what good TV show doesn't end with a twist or, you know, have some sort of twist in there. So yeah, all of that applies in. It's just, it, ultimately, you'll realize it's all just like Russian nesting dolls. You know, it's all just like small containers w inside bigger containers inside bigger containers, right? So I hope that answers your question. Zach asked us, and we have a couple of similar questions. People are a little bit curious about downtime. So before I let Dave explain it a little bit more, downtime has two major components when you're play when you're describing that. So sometimes in our adventures, uh, you may see this. I think the example that comes to mind right away is Hand of the Eight, Chapter Seven, and uh, for us, where you may have to have the characters perform research that takes them a while in the middle of session to go do, where they have to stop for a day, five days, 10 days, however long you want your downtime to be to explore things. One of the things that Dave has been experimenting with a lot lately is letting the game exist and breathe between sessions, where especially at early level play when the party is more like weekend warriors, they could take on a week of downtime to do pit fighting or working a job or carousing to get more contacts to help them figure out other stuff. It's a way to keep your players potentially engaged between sessions and otherwise allows people to flavor what exists in their character beyond their commitment to the other characters in the party. Uh, this course, uh, to, to answer the other half of the question, is going to focus on adventure writing. We probably won't go into extensive detail about downtime here. Uh, but there are ways to incorporate it into your adventures when you're writing for people or to have it space out content in your play. Uh, we have another question here from Tom. He asks us uh, what official supplements we recommend. Official supplements define like... Like uh, Xanathar's Guide, Tomafo's, Volo's Guide. Well, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, and keep in mind, I'm I'm not an affiliate with WotC. I don't even know if they exist um, or they know I exist. Um, but yeah, I for for adventure writing, I mean, ultimately the DMG, um, there's a there's a few books that I get a lot of good ideas from. Uh, Salt Marsh has some really cool stuff in it. Um, if you if you were ever interested in creating a totally random adventure with nothing but tables, Salt Marsh is your hookup and adopting. I love adopting that 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 theme that they have in there where everything is like generated through these random tables from like the boats you meet in the ocean to like the islands <clears throat> uh, acquisitions incorporated i think has a lot of cool ideas in it too <clears throat> and it's it is the downtime book i think on the subject of downtime uh it really does downtime really well and i know some people who run some acquisitions incorporated um style games using those rules and seem to have a lot of fun with it because it's a lot of like um stuff going on in the background that you can manage that I think is really cool. Uh, I think Theros was like, I'm, I'm not a magic player. I mean, well, I was back in the nineties, <laughs> but like, uh, I, I do like, the, I do like the Theros book from some of its ideas that it's got in there. Um, and I've incorporated some of that really. Um, if you want a good model for what I think modern adventure writing should look like, there's two books in particular, um, Rime of the Frost Maiden um, is, in my opinion, the best thing that they have published so far. It's very tight. It's it feels like a sandbox um, more so than I think like some of the other sandbox you know style games do. And it just um, it, it's like everything's like perfectly balanced for like single sessions up until the point you get to about level five or so, and then you know you go on the main quest. Like I've been crafting a lot more of my material to kind of follow that that tier one side questy into tier two main quest um path that ryan has and we've we've just deconstructed the book and like we i've run it sarge is currently in another campaign with it um and then a dragon device by peak is also a really um well constructed product um it, it again like does a great i think i think it could use a little bit more hand holding personally but i mean i think they were trying to crowd a lot of the content into 64 pages but again it's that that side quest leading up to a big quest uh format which i think watsi's really starting to perfect um and then just um if you want to really understand some great adventure writing grab like old dungeon magazines you can get most of them online for free and archive. I mean, 
look, sorry, Paizo, I'm giving away magazines that you wrote 10 years, 12, 13 years ago. <laughs> but um, they, they, there's some really clever adventure writing. They can be kind of wordy because those guys were having to write for word count <laughs> and getting paid for the word. Um, but some of the, there's some fantastic adventures. Chris Perkins, who's current lead designer for um, Dungeons and Dragons, got his start as a writer in Dungeon Magazine. And frankly, his adventures are like, they're works of art. I mean, they're really, really tight, have cool locations. They're very simple, easy to follow. And you can kind of see why he has the job that he does now based on that. So th those would be my recommendations. That's what I read. Um, but I, as far as the books go, I own all of them. I've read most of them. I've run probably half of them. <laughs> so yeah, I think you just, um, yeah, just take a look at all those. All right. So I'll right, we'll take one more question. And, and I'll we'll answer this one pretty quickly, and then we'll take a little break here. Uh, Jonathan asked us, uh, how do you avoid eye-rolling when using a familiar trope? Uh, Dave <laughs> talked about this a little bit earlier, <laughs> and that's usually our answer. Uh, the, I'll give you the answer I give to the other writers we work with. Um, tropes are good because the DM is outnumbered at the table. The DM is only creative in, in, in themselves, and they're trying to set up challenges for the players but you're setting up things for the players to knock down. And there's usually two to seven of them at a modern table. So they're always going to be clever. And so we often recommend that it's incredibly important to telegraph what's going on. You want your players to feel the tropes. If they're playing through Star Wars Episode Four, they should know that on the front end. Yeah. So they can lean in. They can play around with the... Luke Skywalker, reluctant hero, but he really wants to go trope. They can play around with the uncle, with the uncle Owen wants to be grumpy, or they can be Obi Wan Kenobi if they want to be. It's mm -hmm. important to let your players be creative, and if you don't bring them in so they can participate in the storytelling by hiding the hiding things from them, they're going to have a hard time connecting to the game, and they'll make smaller choices. They won't be as bold with the game. Yeah, I. It, it kind of is a balance between um, like, you know, half tropes would be surprising, but don't use too much surprise. And the, the tropes, you know, originally I was like, oh, meta, you know, but then I, I just kind of like went with it. Like, yeah, we all know that trolls are, you know, allergic to fire. And <laughs> we all know that if you enter a room and there's just a single chest in the middle of the room, it's probably a mimic, right? But it's playing with those concepts that I think could be fun. It also rewards your players. It's not a bad thing to reward your players for understanding the tropes and being reactive to it. I mean, even, even if you read something as dangerous as like the Tomb of Horrors, um, they put like a giant diamond in the middle of a room sound, surrounded by a bunch of like disintegrated skeletons. Right. And it's obvious like the trope is like, there's something wrong with that gym, but it's fun because you know, there's something wrong with it. But then the, also that curiosity is like, well, I really want to pick that gym up now. I, I have, know to. What... I have yeah. to touch it. <laughs> Dave, Dave ran to my horrors for me and my character yeah. died twice. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it's just a matter of, um, it's, it's all in balance, you know, just making sure that, um, you know, it's fun. And honestly, like I, commercially speaking, if you are interested in doing this professionally, writing tropes is one of the easiest ways to put money in your pocket. I mean, people are looking for tropes. They want looking for that familiar thing. And it's the, the weird little changes that you make that are always going to make like them be like, oh, that's so clever. You know, obviously don't write something that's a, a trope through and through, you know, but, you know, the little surprises and changes are really what makes a difference. Um, let's take a little break. Uh, I guess we can get back at 8.50. So if you want to get a drink of water, use the restroom, um, do some jumping jacks, shovel. Oh, if anybody wants to shovel my driveway, that'd be great. Uh, <laughs> I don't like, I saw snow for the first time in about two years. I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, me neither. I'm not a fan. This, I, that's why I live in Oklahoma. I'm not supposed to have this stuff. But uh, yeah, guys, thanks for participating so far. We'll be back in about seven minutes. I wish there was like a little like, do not like a little sign. Maybe I can turn the whiteboard on. Here we go. Like, uh, B. R oh no. B. <laughs> oh my goodness. A. Fifty. Wow. <laughs> this is why I, this is why I learned how to type, y'all. So I don't have to <laughs> do all that. I'm gonna get some water. I'll be right back.
I turned some music on. Hoping that. From turning off. Yeah. I like how right after you walked away, I found a way to add text to the whiteboard. I know. I saw that. <laughs> You're wondering what our process looks like, everybody. This is it. We a damn mess. <laughs> we a damn mess. You know? That's uh, <laughs> Ship it. So I'm out of, like, Dave, are we done? I don't know. Just put it out there. Somebody will tell us if it's broken. <laughs> That's a good um honestly it's a good philosophy to have. I'll probably talk more about that in my um as weeks go on, but um I definitely believe in like <clears throat> getting rapid feedback. That's the only way you can get better is if you get feedback as fast as possible and adjust as quickly as possible. Um and I like uh we'll be uh, offering like a, a separate course from this one afterwards and i talk a lot about those philosophies and that and if you ever want to pick my brain about business stuff too yeah just hit me up on <laughs> uh don't ping me please i got enough pings but still like uh the i've got a course on content professional content creation that follows this one and i talk about a lot of my philosophies and it's always been like put it out there and see what's up if it's broken people will tell you and they'll tell you very quick <laughs> Hey, you still got to get that too, Greg. The Beatles, uh, the Beatles, um, used to play cover songs at a bar for like eight hours every night when they started out. So one, I mean, I mean, constant practice plus constant feedback on how they can improve. Um, and I'm listening to Metallica right now. <laughs> same, same story with those guys. Uh, but yeah. All right. It's eight fifty. Let's get started. Thanks all for hanging in there. We appreciate you. We love all of you. Um, hopefully we can get you lots of cool information on this. All right. Boop. All right. So adventure structure. This is pretty simple stuff. If you look at page 72 of the DMG, um, you'll see that there are three parts to an adventure, just like a story. There's a beginning, there's a middle, and there's an end. All right. So the beginning <clears throat> is going to be your narrative hook of the adventure that offers the why. And it really, it's not just for the characters, but the players too. And the players need to be given a choice to, to cross the threshold, so to speak. So if you're a fan of philosophy, you may be familiar with um, the works of Joseph Campbell, whose writing permeates everything. Um, that threshold is always that initial decision to step out of your comfort zone and put yourself into a situation, you know, in a, Lord of the Rings, it's literally like the moment like Sam and Frodo step out of um, uh, the Shire and start going on their adventure, you know, and in Star Wars, it's him going to Mos Eisley Cantina. Um, you know, there needs to be that moment, too. Typically, it's pretty straightforward in an adventure. You know, it's like some guy in a cloak offers to pay you 50 gold if you go punch an orc in the face, you know. <laughs> but yeah, that's going to be your beginning. Uh, the middle of the adventure, that's where the bulk of the adventure takes place. Um, this is where the players get to make the most meaningful choices that have a clear effect on the ending of the adventure. And it also, it, it stands to build tension. Um, even though you might have a general idea of how you want the end of your adventure and story to go, um, ultimately, whether or not it gets to that point or towards like ending B or ending C depends on the actions and choices that the players and the characters make during the middle of the adventure. So um, I would say like, you know, that's going to be 50% of what you put into there is maybe even like more than that, like 80%. And then the end is going to be the climax of the adventure. It's the big payoff based on the choices that the characters made. It's going to be the big fight with the bad guy. It's going to be that ultimate moment of um, tension and release where, you know, the characters solve a mystery or they they save the last person from a burning building. Um, this is usually you always going to have kind of an idea of how you want to get there. But remember, you want to make sure that the, the, the heroes are the ones who matter and that they're the ones who are like steering the ship in that path. But pretty simple stuff. <clears throat> uh, in terms of like how long to make each part, I mean, I would say, you know, it's very Pareto principle. Um, middle should be the bulk of the adventure. You know, give that about 80% because that's where 20% of the play and that's where most of the play is going to be. 
and then the beginning and the end don't really have to be um, that long, maybe like 10% of your story each. You know, those aren't hard measurements. Don't take them by any chance. But the middle is always going to be where the focus of the adventure is. That's the the dungeon or the wilderness area or, you know, the 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 sneaking into a bad guy's lair or whatever you have. OK, uh, adventure types. So if you look at page 73 of the DMG, there's really two core types of adventures. Um, you have location based adventures, which I think is really probably the most popular style of fifth edition and D&D all the way from the beginning. Uh, classic examples include Tomb of Horrors. Most of the adventures in Tales of the Yawning Portal are location based and many of the adventures in Ghosts of Salt Marsh. Um, location based adventures are ultimately the purest form of role playing game, especially in hack and slash style games like fifth edition. Um, and some of the older adventures don't even have like a starting town or even a hook. You're just there to fight and steal some gold, right? Um, I think the initial, the, like the first ever adventure, Castle Greyhawk, which, you know, Garrett, I think it was Gygax and Arneson came up with was like, um, uh, uh, just going into a dungeon and seeing how far you could get, you know, it's, it's just pure D&D. Now uh, the next type or the other type of adventure are event based adventures, a little bit more complicated. <clears throat> Popular examples include Storm King's Thunder, and I'd say Waterdeep Dragon Heist. Um, and there's a little bit of that in all, like, sort of the, the big module books. Um, an event-based adventure is less about one major location or even, like, a series of major locations, but more about um, how making a certain choices can divert the path of the adventure. And event-based adventures have... Um, to subtypes as well, uh, mystery adventures, which typically start with like a murder or you know a theft of some sort, where the characters have to uncover the you know the who, what, when, where, how, and why of it, and ultimately you know put a stop to whoever did it, or you know not, <laughs> as the case may be. And then intrigue adventures, which are more of an adventure based on like. Um, I'd say a lot more social interactions go on with those and they're way more into like the NPCs of an adventure and other important characters and how they interact with each other. Um, on a scale of location based, it, like on a scale of difficulty, I'd say location based is by far the easiest, followed by, you know, broad event, event based, then mystery, then intrigue is probably the hardest. And the reasons for that is um, the ch in a location-based adventure, they're the easiest to write because your choices are really limited to what's within the dungeon or location. So it's easy to keep your characters on track, right? They have hard limitations of where they can go. Um, it's, you know, even even like a um, something like a Curse of Strahd, right? You really are trapped in Barovia. The mists won't let you escape. Um, it's really just the outside of Barovia is just like a dungeon but with open ceilings <laughs> so you, you can keep them kind of confined to that spot and you really only have to detail what's what happens within the location itself with very little like if then kind of formulaics uh event-based ventures are harder to write because you really have to consider all the possibilities in the adventure um you you want to try to always direct them on the path that uh ultimately leads to the climax that you, you know you you want with like the happy ending but it can be tricky because you have especially if you're you're not writing for yourself if you were writing an event-based adventure for um to publish you you have to be able to present the information in such a way that the DM understands it and they can run it effectively with their characters who can make choices that can totally get things off. And it's very easy to misstep with event-based adventures and make them seem railroady because um, you know you want it to go a certain way. Um, you 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 try to make it choose your own adventure, but the you know with choose your own adventure book, you either have this page or this page. Sometimes a third page. With event based adventures, it could go anywhere, right? <laughs> and then a tree, like I said, is is the hardest of them all because it involves a lot of NPCs who sometimes may take their actions off screen. Um, and and in, a good intrigue adventure is going to look similar to like 
any sort of like period piece drama. Um, the Game of Thrones show is very much an intrigue um, sort of thing. And yeah, it's got action and combat and stuff, but ultimately it's all about people playing the Game of Thrones. Um, but yeah, uh, for the purposes of this course, we're going to focus on location-based. So even if you have some experience in um, writing, the reason we do location-based is because, like I said, it's, um, it's kind of the purest and easiest uh, adventure to write. And then... Um, uh, maybe later on we'll do event-based stuff, but I'm a, I, I still do tons of location-based adventures because, frankly, they're easy to write and they're fun. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the biggest thing that we run into when we try to do uh, intrigue games. I, when we talk about shows like Game of Thrones or Black Sails or The Expanse, uh, these shows work really well, uh, but you we run into the similar issues you run into with like high fantasy genre that people enjoy, where the storytelling is great, but the you the viewer of those stories is omniscient. The players are only limited to what they see. It'd be like watching Game of Thrones, but only following uh, Joffrey or Sansa or Arya. Where, like Arya's story makes like Arya basically would just come back and then hears about everything that happens. For yeah. her, the, the story is her what? Who am I stabbing? Around and then <laughs> and then learning how to stab people. <clears throat> yeah. And then she comes back. And so <clears throat> you're, it's difficult when you're doing intrigue games for the players to participate in what's happening with the other factions. And so you have to mix that style of play in with other styles of play. When you find when one of the things we try to do when we're trying to tell event based and mystery stories is we'll include location-based quests and elements so that the party has a chance to do some traditional aspects of D&D &D and deploy their skills to get information, which they can use to participate in the mystery and the intrigue. And it lets them feel like they're participating in some of the choices that way. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, um, like I said, uh, <clears throat> it's definitely more of an advanced style of writing. Um, our editor, Scott, has a great quote about... Um, <laughs> Uh, the styles of adventures and what people start out writing is like when you're first starting out, you start with location based because frankly, it's, it's easy. It's fun. You know, there's the exploration part involved with, you know, running through a dungeon or, or wilderness location. Uh, then when you feel like a little bit more confident with your, your writing ability, you move on to event based and you try to do more complicated stuff. But ultimately after a while, you just go back to doing location based because it, it really is the purest form of D and D it's fun. It's easy to do. I mean, these days I can, put in some numbers on a spreadsheet and, you know, run it. Uh, event based takes a little bit more, more thinking like, oh, how did, how did it get to this point? And like, you know, how did, what, what, what's in this mystery and what spells would they use? You know, it could be a little bit more complicated. So like I said, I mean, I definitely recommend giving a try um, event based, but for the purposes of this course, <clears throat> we're going to be doing location based. All right. Let's see what's next. All right. So, we are going to um, get directly down into the planning and adventure part. So now that we've got kind of all the basics out of the way, <clears throat> excuse me, and you understand kind of the, the elements of what's going to go into it, uh, we're going to uh, actually sit down and plan an adventure. I've actually got a sheet that I'm going to share with everybody here that I put together. Um, if I can get it pulled up. This is going to be on Google Docs, so you'll need... Um, You'll need to have your browser ready for this. Uh, when I share it with you, uh, you will want to, uh, let's see, I'm going to put it in chat here. Uh, if you'll pin that for me, Sarge. Um, once you open up that document, you will uh, want to go to the file and make a copy. So you've got it. Uh, you're, oops, did I give it the wrong one? No, I gave the right one. Okay, cool. Yeah, there's 77 people in there. <laughs> uh, yeah, you'll want to make a copy for yourself so you can edit it. This is this is a non-editable copy. All right. And this is going to be the actual sheet that we use. This references the tables and the um, adventure planning stuff for location-based adventures that you can find on page 72 of the DMG. And what we're going to do is... Um, we're actually going to go through this and and each piece. And as homework, you're going to be filling it out too. So it should be pretty fun. <clears throat> All right. 
So the first major thing is going to be to identify the party's goals. And that is basically whatever reason it is that they have for going into uh, whatever location is you're going to do, whether it's a dungeon or a wilderness location or something like totally random, like maybe like a haunted house or something. Sorry, Dave, you go ahead and something? pull up your screen uh, so they can see you fill in. in oh, I'm, in I'm not filling it in yet. I'll do it. I'll do it once we're done. Um, okay, cool. I, I, I was kind of debating on that because I did it on Monday. Should I do a different one for today? I don't know. It's complicated. <laughs> I don't know if we have time to do three adventures. But yeah. We can show, show them the sheet we got. From uh, three adventures. Come on, Sarge. That would take me like a day. Give me a break. Um, yeah, just are working on it right now. Secret stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll show you guys my, my own sheet. I, I filled one out on Monday and I'll show you exactly kind of how it works. Uh, okay. So once you know your party's goals, and I, I legitimately use these tables, and I showed folks on um, the other day, like I, I seriously, I just, when I've, when I'm blocked and I don't have a good idea for adventure, um, I just go straight to the tables and roll up some good ideas. So you've got dungeon goals and they're all pretty basic stuff. I mean, again, familiar tropes, right? Uh, stop the dungeon's monstrous inhabitants from raiding the surface world, foil an evil villain scheme, destroy a magical thread, acquire a treasure, you know, and so forth. Um, these usually give like a good idea, like why you got to go to that dungeon. Uh, there's similar tables for the wilderness goals if you prefer doing kind of a wilderness setting. And then there's um, other goals too, like um, you might have just like a totally different location that you want to use or, or some of the reason to go to a specific location. <clears throat> Once you've got goals at a place, and don't worry about doing this now, there's going to be homework with this and you just have to bring it back next week when you come to the next session. Uh, next is to identify important NPCs. Uh, you want to identify the villain, of course. Um, the which is ultimately going to be the motivating factor in this adventure, the reason the characters are doing what they do. Uh, you And then as bonus, I'll tell you later, we're not going to cover it in this course, but if you go to chapter four, that will really help you flesh out some NPCs and kind of come up with some cool ideas. Uh, after villains, come up with the allies for your adventure. Your allies are going to be kind of like fun people along the way who, you know, they could be like one of the villain's lackeys who decides to help you, or they could be like a friend in town, or it could be like the spunky kid who's like following you in the adventure. Uh, and then finally, you've got patrons, and your patron is going to be the person who's kind of asked the characters to help them with this issue that they have and get involved in the adventure. You know, they're the person who says, if you do this, I'll give you 50 gold pieces or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, that you also want to kind of identify them uh, again, it's okay to use tropes. Um, God knows, like, you know, the, the farmer who's mad that his crops have been eaten or his livestock's been eaten. Uh, you know, it's been done a million times, but you know what? It works. That people are familiar with it. Uh, if there was any place to put tropes in, I think the important NPCs or the patron NPCs are probably one of the best ones. Like, yeah, a guy in a cloak in a bar. Hey, we know he's got a quest, right? <laughs> Essentially, using tropes in that area is like the equivalent of like putting a um, question mark above their head in a video game. Okay, so once you've got your NPCs knocked out, uh, you want to flesh out location details. Basically, you want to decide what kind of location that it's going to be that's relevant to uh, the adventure itself. And this may even mean picking out a good map to go with it. Um, I'm going to give you guys a resource for maps and the people that I use, um, all of which are either free or have or have free versions of their maps that you can use online, including commercial licenses. So you'll get that at the end of this uh, this part of the course. Um, but yeah, you want to decide what is the location that it's going to be in. Like if they are, if giant spiders are attacking the nearby village. Where are the spiders coming from? Are they, do they have a nest in an old mine or are they in the forest or something? Uh, if it's an evil wizard making problems, does that wizard have a tower on the outskirts of town or is he just living in a mansion right in the center of town? Um, you know, that's kind of what you decide next and, and kind of breathe some life into it. Again, there's more tables in the DMG that can help you figure out what your location should look like. So feel free to read through chapter three. It's got lots of cool stuff like that. Uh, then you want to find the ideal introduction. This is kind of like the narrative hook of how the characters get involved. Um, they could be traveling in the wilderness. The characters fall into a sinkhole that opens beneath their feet, dropping them in the adventure location. The uh, 
what's the one? Uh, um, I think one of the ones from the Yawning Portal starts exactly like that. <laughs> uh, the characters notice the entrance to the adventure location, right? Um, I think that's like Tomb of Horror. It starts like that. It's like, oh, this, this hill looks like a skull. I wonder what that's about. <laughs> uh, traveling on the road, they're attacked by monsters. Um, that's Fandelver right there. So, I mean, there's um all kinds of ways for them to get involved and you can use the uh, adventure introduction to do that oh and just so you guys know if you don't want to use the random tables for your own adventure that we're going to be writing you don't have to uh, i think it's fun and it kind of flexes your brain a little bit but if you've already got like a really cool idea by all means use that um every time sarge pops up pops up i'm like what did i do sarge did i forget something no i was just gonna i'm just gonna tack on when we talk about this when like Dave is reviewing uh, the tools within the DMG. We stress that he mentioned this before. Like the DMG is the end product of four decades of experience and research on Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, there's a I don't want to go on a screed about this, but in the early parts of Five E, there was this attitude that people didn't really need the DMG. You just had to be creative on your own. And it's important to remember that the way you go about assembling an adventure is about asking questions and then putting the pieces in front of you. Why does the party care about this? Who's going to give the party a quest? What does the quest entail? What are they going to fight? The DMG is a tool that helps get your brain moving so you can answer those questions because the players make all of the choices. The game runs on the decisions the players make. We just set up all of the dominoes for them to knock down. And the DMG is a useful tool to help assemble those quickly for your players with a little bit of guidance about how to get there. So... When we're when you're filling out the sheet, by all means, you can put whatever you want in there. It's meant to help you get your brain juices going, so you can assemble your encounter, so the party has something cool to explore. Yeah, and and just kind of to add to Sarge's thing about the, you know, answering questions. Um, like I'm I'm a pretty prolific writer. Like in my, I'd say when I started off, <clears throat> I used to answer questions on Cora, and I do about fifteen thousand to seventeen thousand words a day answering questions <clears throat> these days i'm probably like closer to five to ten thousand on what i'm putting out on paper uh and the big reason is is because i'm never thinking about like what i'm saying i'm thinking more about answering a series of questions that are in my head about what is going on in the story and that that includes not just like writing adventures which is ultimately just technical writing but like if i were to sit down and write a novel it'd be the same way i'd be asking myself questions like who is this person what are they feeling and then writing it out. Um, you know, the education system of the U.S. especially has kind of trained us to do that anyways. We all remember having to write lengthy answers, you know, for, for questions on exams. And it's really just the same thing. You just think what, like, when I'm writing an adventure, I'm thinking exactly those things. Like, who's the villain? Why are they a villain? What's their deal? Um, who's paying the who's got the 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 players to get into this adventure how do they get involved in the first place <clears throat> and really just answering those questions like i don't leave the questions on paper sometimes i'll put them on paper but ultimately like you know it's just me answering questions that are in my own head so in a lot of ways i guess you could say that i'm a crazy person who talks to myself but. <laughs> <laughs> and this uh, is how you get to the uh you days about to go over the climax stuff and we'll talk about why they don't really roll out the middle yeah in a second yeah next um right after the introduction you go into the climax so you figure out kind of like what the ideal climax is for <clears throat> the adventure now keep in mind that's ideal climax that doesn't mean the way it's going to end because remember the the characters are the ones who make the meaningful choices and build the tension that ultimately lead up to that climax and if 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 you know they fumble their way through the the middle story they may not even get to that climax and may end up with something different <clears throat> but the adventure climax should be um something interesting i think if there was anywhere that you didn't want to use tropes you know you want to have the adventure climax be kind of exciting yeah we've all had to like go and fight the thing but i mean if you look at the table here it's got some really clever ideas like the dungeons falling apart uh, as the they're fighting the villain. There's like a bunch of traps and hazards and stuff. Uh, an ally might betray the adventurers. Like these are fun places to put in surprises that kind of change it up from just the uh, aha, we've got you, and now we're gonna fight you. You know, it's it's like yeah, we've we've seen that, but let's make it a little bit more interesting. <clears throat> and finally, plan encounters. Now, I'm not gonna go too much into plan encounters because it 
really next week's section is um, next week's course is going to be like, that's going to be the bulk of what we do next week um, in terms of like uh, the, the nitty gritty math of it, because we, we are going to pr primarily be focusing on fifth edition rules, um, which is very like, there's math into it, but let me tell you this, like you don't have to be a math genius to figure it out. It's just the DMG. I love the book, but God help me if it didn't make it really more complicated than it needs to be. It's really simple to like balance encounters and make them all work out right. Um, once you kind of get the hang of it, you're like, oh, it's really simple. Some of you might already kind of be aware of how to like balance uh, encounters and stuff for a session, but we're going to be most focusing mostly on planning encounters um, next week because it is a really big part of fifth edition and it ultimately is um, that middle chunk that's really important. And when I say encounters, it's encounters can be anything from traps hazards combat encounters uh tricks obstacles uh it could be social interactions it could be um you know having to search for something like all that stuff is going to be we're going to address next week <clears throat> and how it could fit uh like comfortably into your adventure uh and it's a lot of fun i love it i mean like like i said i, I could open up a spreadsheet these days and just do it like boop, and there i got all my encounters and they're all balanced <laughs> um but you'll see there is a second tab on that sheet that i gave you and that tab will have um all those like there's an encounter side on it too don't worry about that one side this week we're going to be messing with that uh next week uh if you are interested in reviewing the event-based section um which comes directly after location-based and is on chapter on page 75 interestingly you'll see it starts with the villain uh determines what the villain did and then it's so it kind of goes backwards from this. Uh, we're not going to be doing event based with this, but if you want to kind of review that and mysteries and all the other stuff, definitely read chapter three. It's also part of your homework assignment. Um, but chapter three is uh, it's the heart of adventure making in the DMG. And keep in mind, this was written by like guys who got their start doing just adventure writing, like Mike Marles, uh, Jeremy Crawford, uh, Chris Perkins, all those guys uh, help put this DMG together. So they really know what they're talking about. Um, some of the best adventures I've ever run are by um, Mike Merles and, and uh, Chris Perkins. So, all right, maps, 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 maps. So we talked about um, finding the perfect map to set. We have become ninjas at finding maps over the years. I am going to give you all my stuff top secret document that you could find with a Google search <laughs> uh, that has um, some of my favorite resources. I'm going to be adding to this as we go through, but I'm going to paste this here in the chat right now. And I think Sarge will get in. So this little bad boy here has a list of some of my favorite map designers that I use and many of which have uh, commercial use for their maps as well. Um, and these are these are people I legitimately, those top four right there, I use constantly. Um, Dyson Logos is some of the first adventures I ever wrote were off of Dyson's maps. He's a professional WotC designer. Um, he's the father of the Dyson style, which I'm sure you've all seen, has a lot of cross hatching. <clears throat> uh, Tim Harton, is another Watsi professional, a really nice guy. Uh, I've got a great relationship with him. Uh, he does huge black and white dungeons, probably best known for Dungeon of the Mad Mage. And soon we'll be doing, um, both he and Dyson are doing maps for uh, the new Candlekeep book, which comes out next week. Uh, my favorite and my number one collaborator is Tom Kartos. Uh, I think he's got free versions of his maps on his Patreon. Um, which will have like his watermarks and grids. Uh, he does have commercial licensing as well, which you can use. Um, I think you have to upgrade and you don't get like all the variants, but um, Tom's got a lot of really cool, he, he's big into buildings and random encounters. He's a former architect. So his stuff is like really smart. Uh, Chi and Peku, of course, uh, the battle map masters. Uh, <laughs> one of the few people who has more patrons than I do in this market. <laughs> uh, other, also good friends of mine, regular collaborators with them and a bunch of other folks. Uh, he's got some dungeon-y locations, but mostly it's going to be battle maps. There's just really gorgeous bad, battle maps that they paint. Uh, Limithron, I haven't done a lot with, but he's a super nice guy, Luke. Lots of different maps, mostly coastal, ship-themed. Uh, Mad Cartographer is another person who I haven't used a lot for. I think 
lots of battle maps, but branching out into different stuff. I think he's been doing like a swamp series this week. I keep keep getting notifications. Uh, if you want to create your own maps, Dungeon Draft is really good for location-based maps, especially like dungeons, as the name implies, but also the insides of houses. I'd say not so great for like wilderness and stuff like that. Uh, you'd want to use for wilderness something like Incarnate. Uh, Incarnate is absolutely gorgeous um, uh, map making software. A little bit more complicated than Dungeon Draft, but really good for like regional stuff and um, uh, I'd say like cities. Uh, I use it for all my regional maps now. Uh, another group, great group of designers work with that. Uh, I've got a good relationship with. If you don't want to think too much about it, what about? Uh, has procedural dungeon town and city generators, and they're crazy good. Like some of the best proc generators I've ever seen. And you know, that reminds me, I should have put Donjon in there too. If you want something that's even a little bit more random than than that, Donjon uh, is another one. Also a really good resource just in general for fifth edition stuff. Uh, Donjon. And I'm uh, sure uh that has procedural generators for dungeons uh they're a little bit more like crazy and all over the place but really fun for caverns and then what's cool is you can import them in a dungeon draft and trace over them if you want to make them color and then uh nat ones is another battle maps creator that uh i've been told about recently who has uh a commercial licensing through patreon um but yeah like all really really good resources for you um you sh and if you're doing, keep in mind, if you're doing this stuff private and you don't need commercial, then you've got way more stuff open to you. Like as a publisher, like I have to use stuff that's got commercial licenses. Some of these guys, like Tim Harton, for example, um, I just buy directly from him. Um, so, you know, we've got that. But uh, but like Dyson is like 100% uh, open for you. All right, let's see where it's going to work in our jam. Yep, Donjon is important to yeah. Camp I haven't used campaign cartographer, but yeah, like Donjon and what about are amazing. Um, okay, all right. So let's take some more questions, and then we'll we'll go over the we'll go the homework. <laughs> <laughs> um, I answered next question, but uh, we can talk about this for people since we're all living through a pandemic. <gasps> uh, we are has this. Nick has this. Um, are maps for adventures being created with Roll20 and Fantasy Grounds and other uh, VTT platforms in mind more than normally? Oh, uh, yeah, 100%. You can see, <clears throat> even us, when uh, when the pandemic first hit, right around the time I, I left my, my day job, we weren't really doing much at all with VTTs. Like, I was focused primarily on... Um, like actually playing a table and I had a, like a, a live action game, like where I played with people here in the city, including my, my attorney <laughs> and <clears throat> you know, then the pandemic hits and we can't go outside. So um, you see, there's been a big shift in way people have been creating maps. Now, some like Tom and I'd say Chi and Peku have all, always done it with VTTs in mind, but some of the, uh, the old dogs like, like Dyson and Tim now consider it with more in mind. Some of Dyson's older maps are a pain. You'll have to like fiddle with them if you want to get them to be VTT perfect. Uh, and Tim also had the issue until I pointed it out to him where his, his squares were a little bit messed up. But yeah, I'd say these days everybody realizes, you know, that's the way it's going to be. And I honestly think like it's going to continue that after the fact because even me I, I mean i love having physical books i've got like a rolly cart and stuff that i could bring my stuff with but dude if i don't have to cart around like 100 pounds worth of books to run D, &D and i can just crank up roll 20 or you know foundry so or whatever spoiled now y'all i know it's like <laughs> oh, i'm just gonna do that plus all my plus all my kick my players moved away like with the exception of joe like everybody left <laughs> like <laughs> literally like, during a pandemic no less but you know whatever Brittany has asked us um, if we had examples of good intrigue adventures they could look over. Uh, I, weirdly enough, the first one that came to mind when I saw the question, this may seem a little bit odd because it's technically a war campaign, but there's a third edition adventure called Red Handed Doom, where the party spends the bulk of levels 5 through 10-ish uh, trying to help a region survive an invasion by 
hobgoblins and other goblinoids that are being led by a hobgoblin sorcerer who is attached to Tiamat. And that adventure involves the party pursuing down lieutenants for the bulk of the adventure to figure out what objective they're trying to achieve and how to disrupt it. And your ability to pick up on what the worm lords are up to greatly affects the success of your battle sequence of that game. But okay. that's like that's like a but like that's what we talk about. Like Red Handed Doom is a sandbox adventure involving a a regular region getting overwhelmed by a massive threat, and the party goes on a series of mostly location based adventures looking for specific plot tokens to unravel a plot to prepare for a massive multi session battle sequence. Yeah. Um, I'd say Storm King Thunders too. Storm King's Thunder also has intrigue because of the whole ordning aspect. Um, if you like backstory, oh boy, <laughs> you got to read Get like ready. twelve pages of it. <laughs> yeah. Storm King's Thunder. Here's twenty pages of backstory. Dra- giants are important. Read it's, this. It's like that uh, <laughs> that uh, that meme with that blonde-haired woman. Yeah, what? <laughs> She's just like staring at the floor, like <laughs> ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lot, but I mean that's that's you know an intrigue adventure because you have the different um, types of giants like all doing it, and there's that black dragon getting um, or blue dragon like you know screwing up things behind the scene. I'd say that's probably intrigue esque. Um, uh, my guess would be uh, even though I've never played it, like any sort of thing attached to Game of Thrones would have it. But yeah, I mean ultimately, I mean w- when you location kind of can kind of like exist by itself. But I would say the best way to write like mysteries and event-based stuff in general is that there's location-based adventures within um, those adventures. I just put out 55-page uh, mystery adventure, which you can get for free on my Patreon, um, which is really just like a series. Like you know, like I, I when I wrote it, I figured out like everything that went into it. You know, the perfect crime. You know, with one mistake, and it's just a series of like going to the locations to kind of unravel this this crime and figure out what's going on um but yeah i mean there's still like locations and fights and stuff it's not just like let's go here oh look a clue well let's leave you know it's <laughs> no it's like let's go here <laughs> oh man there's a bunch of ghouls we have to punch <laughs> you know <laughs> um so yeah uh yeah whatever questions sam asked us um if we are playing at a table and we don't have a map available how do we navigate players through interesting dungeons without them getting lost in a maze of winding tunnels? <laughs> so if you don't have any map prepared, that's a good question. Um, I'd say always have a map prepared. But if you don't, um, the you know when I have been in this situation before where I've had people like totally go off, um, I'll just go find, you know, something like a random map and like come up with what's in it as i go sometimes using the random tables that's in the dmg um which can kind of keep things on task or um just kind of like you know i might figure out like what the first room is randomly and then go from there um i wouldn't say use the procedural generation tables in the dmg because yes it will make you end up with like crazy like dungeons that kind of go nowhere but um mostly think of it as like I would say you would probably want to do what Bong Joon Ho did in Snowpiercer. Uh, so that's a you, literally railroad a railroad. <laughs> in sense it's literally of, a railroad. <laughs> in the sense of the drama of that movie is in whether or not Chris Evans' character is going to go left or right. Is he going to go left and deal with his humanity he's abandoning and the people behind him? Or is he going to go right and try and charge forward to the front of the train and try and upend the system? Mm. And you can maybe do that thematically with your dungeons. What is the choice in, of the party continuing to push forward versus retreating mean if you're trying to do that at the table in a hurry? You want to just find a way to give them an either-or choice about advancing down a path and let them struggle with that. Like, we could go left, but we have to abandon our friend. We could go right, but it's going to cost us more time and we might not succeed. Yeah, I'd say um, Tomb of Horrors. Uh, especially um there's not a lot of choices involved in where you go and two horses is considered like one of the greatest ever but ultimately it's a very like 
you're almost always going to end up in the couch room <laughs> fighting, you know, fake. That couch. <laughs> yeah, you're going to fight fake a Serac and like then you have then, you know, you're either going to be happy with the gold that's there or realize that there's probably more to be found. And but it's really just a very narrow path to get there. Yeah, there's other choices, but generally those choices are bad choices. And, and, and you know, they're telegraphed like a million miles away. But, you know, like, oh, don't go through the green door or, you know, don't jump through this cl mist cloud. <laughs> You're going to wind up naked outside of the dungeon. Um, so you can you can make choices. They don't always have to necessarily be like what's behind this room. You know, you can have a very like straight path. It's just having the illusion of a choice that ultimately is like you should make that choice, not this choice. If you oh, if you remember the old choose your own adventure books from like the 80s and 90s, and I guess today, I, I think they've had a resurgence, is that really there was only like so many paths actually in the book. And a lot of times you would just end up dying. You know, you would just get eaten by a Yeti. Like, uh, it's like, do you want to get in the helicopter or do you want to like ski down the mountain? Well, I'm going to get in the helicopter. Uh, well, a Yeti eats the helicopter. Like, what? Damn it. What happens if I ski? Oh, you get away from the Yeti. Oh, well, good thing I held my place in that book. <laughs> uh, all right, Sarge, what else we got? Um, Austin is asking us if we have resources for riddles or how do you go about implementing them in your adventures? Funny you ask that. I bought a book on riddles for genius kids that I gave to my son for Christmas one year. And whenever I need a riddle, I just grab that thing and I, I pull from it. And I'm not even joking. Um, it's the riddles are very simple and clean and they don't have ambiguous answers. So that's the thing you got to, if you're going to use like word riddles, <clears throat> they need to have very clear answers. Um, if they're going to be more complicated riddles, uh, like math riddles too, it should have like one clear answer and it doesn't have to be super complicated because what's always going to happen is your the players are always going to overthink it. So you have to make it simple. Um, if it's like a bigger kind of puzzle, you and if it's got like a lot of moving pieces with it, then you're going to need to do um, you're really going to have to drop like a ton of clues to make sure that they know. Uh, Mike Merles wrote a adventure called uh, The Whispering Cairn, which is the first part of the ongoing series of adventures from Dungeon Magazine circa 2004. Oh, we played that. Yeah, you did. And um, you you come into this like chamber, and that's a perfect example of like a very like straight chamber where you've only got certain ways you can go. And you come into this chamber or this this dungeon, and there's a mural that shows like all these lanterns lit up, right? And then like somebody in the middle like hooray or whatever. Then you go into that room that the mural captures, and you see all those lanterns. Only one of them is lit, and then all the other ones are like out. And then like two of them are missing. And in order to solve the puzzle, you have to find all the lanterns and write them, right? And but yeah, there's plenty of clues all the way throughout that lead you through. So the the too long didn't read of this is that simple is gonna be better and it's it's okay to like kind of like bring it down to a, a like a duh kind of level. <laughs> Cause um your your players are always going to overthink it. As far as just word riddles go, yeah, just get a book on kids' riddles. Uh, there's websites on the internet too where um, you could plug in the answer that you're looking for and it'll give you a riddle based on that and I'll use that a lot too. What else we got, Sarge? Sarge, are you there? Sarge, are you muted? Oh, I did it again. My bad. <laughs> uh, there's an interesting question about information delivery here from James. He asked, uh, do you ever indicate that the players need to return to a previously explored dungeon to find more clues they might have missed leading into another secret dungeon or location? Uh, Yeah. I mean, like the climax of a location, like a separate adventure. So like I said, I just wrote this big um, mystery adventure. And what's interesting is there's one part in it where uh, they may not get the thing that they need. Um, you go through this tomb and you're supposed to get this spyglass in order to give this somebody who will give you special information. But um, I've, I've intentionally made it difficult with the intention of like, you might miss that information. Um, but I noted, hey, even if you don't get this item and 
by extension, the information that you're going to get by giving it to this NPC, um, you can still find it out with this. So in situations like that, you have one of two choices. Like um, you, you don't want them to feel like there's a dead end. I, I think it's okay to have like a um, a plan B for the GM because it, it could be, I don't know if that's you guys, but it could be really tedious. Like if you if, if a venture's, like say like a secret door, that's not obvious. Like the whole adventure is leveraged on that. Like, I feel like the secret door in uh, the red brands is really obnoxious because of that. Because if you don't, if you aren't aware that thing exists, you can't complete that mission. So you have a lot of like parties just like, well, I don't get it. Where's the rest of the bad guys? So you almost like I threw in like extra hints to help the party get to the other side of the red brand keep. I mean, it's a great adventure. Don't get me wrong. Lost Minds of Fandelver is very well designed. But the fact that like completing that part of it is based on like a perception check that you have to actively make i thought was kind of dumb um but yeah like kind of like that like always give like something else that you can kind of toss in there like if it's something that's really easy to miss and when it comes to like dropping clues for stuff shower them with it uh if it's gonna you know if it's gonna be particularly hard um like like i said that this there's a big puzzle in this tomb and it's if it's really hard to miss all the different pieces that go into it so one of my proofers was like, you know, like, I think this is really cool, but people are going to miss it. And I'm like, yeah, I think you're right, Roger. So I went back and I, I just tossed in so many clues. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Uh, Blake's asking us if we have resource for puzzles, but it's probably going to be the same. You just Google yeah. stuff. Actually, like, and somebody asked us about Watsi resources. Watsi's latest book offers some guidance on puzzles yeah. for the game. Yeah, they're a little. Um, I, I was a little disappointed by that because I, th I was hoping they would be more like how to make puzzles. Um, if you want some really good puzzle resources, go through Dungeon Magazine and find the Challenge of Champions series. Uh, they all involve um, level agnostic um, puzzles, which the characters must solve in order to get points for. Like, so it's like they're like fun puzzles for like level one to twenty, and. Um, I went through, there, there's four of them throughout the history of Dungeon Magazine. I can't remember for the life of me what issues there are, so sorry. Uh, maybe I'll put them in that that sheet as a, as, as a good resource to read. But um, they're really cool stuff. Like, you know, you have to have, like, a little bit of knowledge. It, it takes, like, knowledge of not just, like, solving a puzzle, but some of it, like, involved with, like, knowing the spells in the game. Um, there's one puzzle, actually, I put into, I kind of cribbed from... Uh, challenge of champions that was in uh my the lich that stole christmas there's like four potions you have to figure out which potion to drink they all have like a little label on them uh you know great artists borrow uh or what is it good artists borrow great artists steal <laughs> so yeah find good ideas on the internet or in other things you know tweak them a little bit but um yeah i mean the internet's your best resources for puzzles. Uh, Desert of Desolation, an old module. I think it's um, I3 through I7 is its official numbering. Has a lot of really cool puzzles in it um, that I'm just like, Ugh, I love them. And that was written by the Hickmans who did uh, Ravenloft. So yeah, yeah, just read adventures. That's one way to do it. And then, yeah, the Google. We got about eighteen minutes left, so let's yeah, let's go into this. Their homework. Yeah, we'll go and, into uh, this, so and then have we'll their link for the next class. Yep. Uh, all right. So going into the next course, uh, let me get the. I'll get the link here, and if you miss it, don't worry. You'll you'll get it emailed. Uh, I'm gonna drop a link in for our next course, which is gonna be same days next week. Obviously, different days. Uh, Right, I got him. I'm drop it now. Ah, no. Okay, okay you did it. Good job. <laughs> oh, cool. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, Challenge of Champions. Cool. I I kind of did my own take on it too. Called um, what do we what do we call it? It's called Trial of Heroes. I believe oh, it is in Broadsword Compendium One. Yeah, in Broadsword Issue so. One, if you can still find a copy. Um, but yeah, go to there. You'll sign up for the next course that will cover. We will go into the nitty gritty of adventure planning encounters. There'll be a little bit of math, but do not worry. It is very simple. Once you get the hang of it, it's um, if you've ever built a, 
honestly, if you've ever played a miniatures game like Warcraft, it's exactly like building a Warcraft army. <laughs> you have a certain number of points that you can use, and each one of your encounters is going to cost X number of points. And once you kind of get it, it's really simple. Um, no, Wesley, if you got the uh, if you get the marketing course, which I'm going to cover here in a second, um, we'll uh, uh, that's that's all we've got right now. Um. All right, so next, fill out the details of your adventure planning sheet. I have already done my own. Let me see if I can find the sheet for you real quick, and I'll show you exactly what I did. We got some good rolls. I'm excited about that adventure. Yeah, it's a pretty wild adventure. <laughs> I'm trying to pick a good map for it. Um, I'm going to share my screen here real quick, guys, so you can see my own adventure that I planned. Uh-oh, falling into Nova. All right, so oh, here's my own <laughs> adventure. Ah, uh, here's my own adventure details sheet. Um, I did all this on random rolls on Monday. Uh, I have to find information needed for a special purpose. Pretty cool. Humanoid conqueror, which is fun. Keep in mind, remember, humanoids aren't just humans. They could be anything from like Durgar to goblins to the uh, Edercaps. Don't care. Yeah, Knowles. Uh, the adventure's ally is a priest. Adventure patron is a former teacher. So Sarge, in this case, will be the patron. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you gotta go save my student oh, no, now. <laughs> uh, the adventurers have to find find a map on a dead body. In addition to the map setting up the adventure, the adventurer's villain wants the map too, so I think that's fun. And then the old dungeon begins to collapse while the adventurers face the main villain, ooh, who attempts to escape in the chaos. So I've already got my details. I'm gonna write an adventure from these prompts from Dungeon Master's Guide uh, 72 to 75. Uh, and then I will have my own adventure with you. Um, I expect all of you to also have these details. Don't worry about writing anything yet. We're going to be working on that probably in the third week when I show you kind of like adventure formatting. And then also don't worry about planning encounters too. We cover that next week. <clears throat> all right, let's end that. And go to, oh, look at us. Hey, uh -oh. there we are. Hey. There we are. <laughs> Let me get the slideshow back on. So annoying. I have to like stop the slide presentation and then restart it. Okay. Uh, find a cool map within which to set your adventure. Use those resources that I've given you there. You're free to do whatever to. And keep in mind, if you want commercial, those are probably my favorite sources for commercial. But if you are just doing it for your own benefit, um, you can do whatever you want to do. Uh, review chapter three of the DMG. Um, like I said, it's if you want to be adventure writing, that is really your the heart of it and as a bonus you can review chapter four which is on npc creation uh which is also super useful uh, okay one final thing everybody um we are going to be continuing this class for uh, another four weeks um so this class plus that's, that's five classes in all we are going to be doing a class that is on becoming a professional content creator which I have just uh, published here for you. Um, let's see. Where's my slide button? Okay. Uh, if you are interested in earning a comfortable living, creating content, this pr class will pretty much teach you all the other stuff that exists outside of writing adventure. Now, remember, you're going to learn everything you need to do an adventure. There's no charge for this course. And if you're just doing it for fun, you know, or whatever, uh, or if you already have a good mind for marketing and stuff like that, you know, this is not, this is, there's no obligation on this. But if you are sort of interested in some of the um, uh, uh, more experienced things like developing a brand for yourself, uh, how to leverage social media, uh, one thing I, I didn't note is I, I totally bootstrapped uh, DM Dave. I did not spend a dime on pretty much anything except for my domain name and. I think a few apps for the website when I started. So I did this all through Instagram and Reddit. Uh, and I'll kind of show you how, like in this course that we'll be doing, um, this uh, bonus course, I'll show you some of those tricks and tips that I have for that. Uh, how, to, how to create content that your fans want using sort of a modern ideas and tech, especially those used by Silicon Valley. I'm a big lean startup fan, so I'm going to go over stuff like that. And then monetization methods. Uh, we've made plenty of money through... Uh, Kickstarter. Uh, currently, I think we've made two hundred thousand dollars between our Kickstarters. Our Patreon, of course, has uh, over six thousand patrons. Thank you all so much. You are the reason that we get to do this, and I hope you know. Obviously, we want to pay it back. 
which is why we have this. Uh, we have our own website, which has sales, and then we also have a presence on Amazon. So, and then additionally, uh, I could teach you stuff about drive through RPG, uh, DMs Guild, things like that. So, uh, normally we're going to do 500 for this class, and by the end of the five weeks, that will be the price for it. Right now, it's half off at 250 so about $50 a class. Uh, we already have, how many people do we already have sign up, Sarge? Good, good amount, like 30, 30 something already. So been a big demand for it. Um, like I said, no obligation. You're going to get this whole course for free. But if you do want to learn more and how to do this for a living and escape nine to five, like I did uh, last year, then by all means, you know, sign up. I promise you'll be worth it. And if you don't like what I teach you in the class, I'll give you your money back. <laughs> no, no point in uh, charging you for something you don't find useful. But um, yeah, if you just click on the offers link there, you go through there. Uh, PayPal, Stripe, blah, blah, blah. Alrighty then. Um, what else, Sarge? I guess we've got, how much time do we have left on the clock here? We have about 11 minutes. So we have time for a couple of questions. Yeah, let's go ahead and put in the Discord we... link. Um, we're going to have another. Yeah, I'm going to post this again. Did you put it in there already? Yeah, I'm going to post it again. Nice. If we're going to probably end up wrapping up here in a couple of minutes. If you'd like to hang out with us and listen to me and Dave ramble without a time limit on us, <laughs> yeah. you can hang out with us on our Discord. Uh, Silver patrons and higher can join the chat and chat with us. Uh, gold patrons and higher can talk to us directly in, in that voice chat. And we'll continue to answer questions. But we have a couple of minutes here if you guys have any lingering questions here uh yes prices listed here are usd we are in america merca um uh we the discount will it'll probably go up as we start filling more spaces um we're just playing it by ear now like originally we only had like x number of spaces and the monday class was like, blah, 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 blah. We're like oh well people want this so uh we, we <laughs> like just like we did with this we originally, originally sure we, we were gonna do like everybody. this all in like one week with just like one class and then like 1200 people signed up and we we're like oh lord so um we uh uh, <laughs> uh we decided to open up a little bit more <laughs> um but yeah like i mean it'll it'll go up a little bit you know this is kind of like the introductory price and really it's just a matter of like you know like the only reason we'd bring up the price was just to be like slow down because <laughs> that one will be that one we hope to be a little bit more hands-on where we can actually like you know work with people in this as far as like whether or not i uh to be considered a writer david um like uh i'd say no um now, granted, you're going to have significant competition. Here's here's what I kind of predict is going to happen, and I, I don't. I'm a person who's like an open book. I don't mind sharing this stuff. Like, you know, we had 1,200 people sign up. So far, about half of the people who've registered have actually come into the class, and then of those, half signed up for the next one. So I think once we get to the end of this, you're going to see like it's going to be you know, like maybe an eighth of the people who who originally got involved with this at the end of the class, at which point we'll be able to be a little bit more hands on the fifth week. I think we're kind of planning is like kind of a, an open ended workshop to work directly with people. Um, and then too, like, um, if you really want to get access to like Sarge and folks like myself being in the discord is really helpful. Uh, we have a legendary patron status for people who've been patrons for what is it one year at least, or, yeah, or it a was platinum or higher. One year at it was one year at a copper or higher. It was less for higher ranks. Yeah. Um, so the uh, uh, there's there's opportunities to get in front of us. Uh, we did. I mean, truth be told, we did just bring on another writer on what was that yesterday? Yesterday. Yeah. Uh, who was actually here. in our, our course? Um, the reason is like you know, friend of a friend, and I'd I'd already read some of his material, so we kind of knew what was up. Um, and we needed a proofer on some other stuff. But um, if you if you are interested in and I'll go over this in the discord, too, um, I'll tell you the truth. So far, um, pretty much everybody who works here, I either with the exception of the Craigs, we hired from the inside or I, I hired them because um, they were in the discord and we got to know them. Uh, Sarge got hired because he was like the very first person to proof like the gobbledygook that I was putting out two years ago. Um, we just hired, uh, Laura Jordan full time. Uh, she was the lead proofer on our proofing team in the channel. 
Um, all of our writers are people who um, I've worked with and and kind of seen their content. Luke just came on. He was a proofer. Uh, are any of the other guys proofers? Oh, TJ, we hired to do our Roll20 stuff. He started off as a writer for Broadsword. And we're expanding pretty quick this year. Um, so there's a lot of like new opportunities that we're opening up to kind of uh, um, if you if you are interested in doing what you like, if you were interested in doing this like full time, we're going to be having lots of opportunities because um, we're, we're going to probably be expanding even outside of like fifth edition and stuff this year. Um, I can't tell you how many times I crack open roll 20 or just anywhere on the internet. And I'm like, oh, why isn't somebody doing this? Why am I not doing this? You know, <laughs> and this year we're, we're addressing that. Um, uh, what other questions do we have? Zach, Zach has a question here. I'll probably take this one. Zach asked us about how uh, long should the first adventure we write? We, we, so we oh, were yeah. explicit with this in the last class. We want you all to stick to maybe 10 to 12 areas in your dungeon. Uh, when you well, we're going to go into encounter design a little bit more next week, but a typical dungeon has about half as many encounters as it has rooms inside of it. Yeah, and so uh, we want you all to maybe stick to about ten to twelve areas with the map you source. And when we start writing, we'll talk more about like the length of an adventure and how we figure that. And so I'll give some baseline guidance of like you want to stay at about three thousand words. That's yeah. about a single session's worth of content. We'll explain the math of that as we get deeper into this and why we arrive at the number 3,000. But if you've read some of Watsi's recent content, you'll see that none of their quests, like in Rhyme, exceed more than two to 3,000 words per quest. That'll give you like a solid session's worth of content for you to lay out for your party that has a good loop. Like, you get the quest. Go, go bop some creatures because they're stealing Miss Mabel's honey out of her no, house. No, Miss Mabel. <laughs> And then you got to go get it back by the end of the session yeah. or you let Miss Mabel down. The, the, um, the, the reality is, um, and Dirk encounters anything that's going to require, um, Dirk asked to find an encounter and encounters anything that like drains the party's resources, whether it's, uh, hit points or spells or whatever it would be, uh, like, that is an encounter. So traps count as encounters. I mean, but yeah, usually when you say encounter, you think like you know, fighting something. Um, we got five minutes left on here. Um, so just so you all know, if it suddenly like boots everybody out, that's why. But be sure to enjoy uh, <laughs> we're gonna, <the> Discord. <laughs> um, we're going to probably transition out of Discord here. I want to thank you all for uh, giving us your time this evening. I know this is late for some folks. Yeah, or really thank you so much. folks. Uh, and there will be replays on this as well after the fact. I think if you just use the same link you did, you'll go in and you'll see that there's a replay. So if you missed anything or you want to take additional notes or you want to stare at me and Sarge and like, <laughs> you know, into our beautiful eyes, you can. Um, but um, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I think I'm going to share that. Uh, Richard at, or somebody asked if... Um, I'll share the slides. Yeah, I think I think we'll put that into the uh, keep that um, the the resources sheet, and I'll put it under there uh, in a different tab. That way, you'll all have it. Thank you all. Oh, and levels. I forgot to say this. Um, the levels of the content uh, we're going to be tier one at first, and I'll probably bring that up more with the planning of the encounters next week. So start thinking of tier one adventures. If you're not familiar with the tiers, tier one is levels one through four. The reason we stick with tier one is because it is one of the easier uh, tiers to write for. Tier, the higher you get up in the tiers, the easier it is for players to break your adventures. So we start with one just because it's simple. You're free to write whatever you want, but that's where we're going to be. Yeah. Remind me to add that to the slide deck. <laughs> Sorry. I'll, I'll make a note for <laughs> make a note for Saturday. Yeah. So I'm gonna take uh I'm gonna take a nine minute break, y'all, and then we're gonna be in uh this Discord channel. I'm gonna be logging into uh the DM Dave workshop. Um, if you are a silver patron, you can listen in, and if you're a gold patron, you can speak. I will also be in the how to write um, table RPGs from which we'll be taking questions, and we'll try to answer questions as well, along with. Uh, myself and Sarge, as well as some of our administrators. But uh, thank you all so much. I uh, love you.
big kisses. I mean, y'all are amazing. <laughs> um, no, I mean, really, I mean, we, you, you make this worth doing, you know, uh, there's never a day where I wake up and, and dread coming to work unless Sarge is making me like rewrite something, but that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but no, for the most part, I, I love what I do and it's because of, uh, the amazing folks, um, that support us on Patreon and Kickstarter and everything else. So we'll see you in the discord channel. Thank you all so much. Uh, if you're going to bed, have an awesome night. Peace. Good night, everybody.